Today I've got Abdi joining me. He's an international cameraman and one of the most inspiring people I know. Um, I'm recording this from the office in Bath in Britain. And Abdi, tell me where you are and just tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do, please. Uh, I'm in Istanbul, Turkey, um, in my living room at the moment. And I am a cameraman, like you said. I work for a company called uh, CBS. Uh, their headquarters is in New York, in America, um, but they've got bureaus in London, and I am kind of one of two people that they have in Turkey. Great stuff. And just for people listening to this, and just for you, Abdi, um, you know, this is all about us getting across at some flower to young people the power employability skills can have, the small things they can do each day, and how that can unlock great opportunities. And that's helped me hugely in my my career. I'm interested to find out your story. So people should really just sit back, listen to someone who's had a wonderful journey and gone on to do incredible things with their career. Abdi, could you just describe, say, what your last sort of couple of months, say last three to six months have been like professionally in some of the places you, you found yourself working? Um, yeah, sure. I can, um, I can certainly try. Um, six months is... Um... It's a long time. If I if I kind of go back, because I can't, I can't off the top of my head remember. We've been we travel so much. We got to so many different places that I can't tell you where I was exactly six months ago. But if I work backwards, that might be a better way of um, kind of remembering where I've been. Yeah, and, just uh, just some of just some of the sort of the, the highlights, I guess, in, in in the least insensitive way. I know there's been some big news stories that people around the world yeah. will have been following. Yeah. Well, the most the most recent story we did uh, was uh, on the uh, refugee crisis that's kind of gripping the world at the moment, where you've got people crossing from Libya to Italy, and you've got people crossing now from Turkey to Greece, and we went to Izmir, uh, a city on the Turkish coast, and then drove three or four hours up to Assos, which is um, the closest you could get from Greek, uh, Turkey to Greece. And we found the Syrian family with a little boy who looked remarkably similar to Thailand. Um, the little boy, little Syrian Kurdish boy who was found uh, drowned on the beach. And we interviewed them. And then they told us that they were going to go and try and make that journey the following day. And that they tried before but failed. And we waited around. We hired a fishing boat. We went on at sea with them and we were following them as they made that journey on a little dinghy with uh, 45, 55 other people. And uh, it was pretty scary. It was kind of, um, we weren't sure if they were going to make it, not make it. Um, and then as their boat went out, eight other boats, similar boats, similar dinghies carrying around 50 more refugees kind of came alongside them and they were all making, uh, making a kind of making for the Greek coast. And then out of nowhere, this unmarked grey boat uh, that belonged to the Greek Coast Guard came out and started disabling all of the boats. And on, on, on this unmarked boat from the Greeks, there were five men, each with uh, a machine gun, dressed in balaclavas, um, kind of flouting international law by, by disabling these boats and putting these people's lives in danger. And we were able to get that on camera. We stayed back so that we wouldn't get into trouble. We called the, Greek, uh, the Turkish Coast Guard, who took an hour to come, and in that time there was a lot of panic and fear about from the people on the boats and, and from ourselves about what would happen if the boats were to sink, what would we do, what would we do? could we rescue them all, uh, obviously we couldn't, but we got that all on camera uh, and we got a very good piece out and it broke the news that the Greeks were doing this and we got visual evidence of it as well, so that was a very good story. Before that, I'd kind of done a few stories in Turkey around the uh, instability with the PKK um, and Turkey kind of getting involved in the fight against ISIS in Syria. Uh, before that, I was in Libya doing the other end of this uh, refugee crisis. And so we went to Misrata and we were working, kind of following the Coast Guard there as they rescued recovered bodies uh, and patrolled the Libyan coast, basically with three boats and very few men and not enough resources. Uh, we went to a morgue where the bodies that were unclaimed uh, the unclaimed bodies of the refugees who were found at sea or on the, on the streets and stuff were kept. Some had been there for a year for kind of administrative reasons, and that was pretty difficult. Uh, we went to a prison where, like, a room, maybe probably like a four by four room, there were like 50, 60 people sleeping on the floor in prison, basically, being held there because the Libyans have to be seen to be doing something and they can't stop the tide of people going. But 
the officers there do go out every day and they try and kind of uh, they round up some unlucky people that they come across so that they are like seen to be doing something about the crisis and that was a pretty desperate um desperate situation um do you want me to keep going um and maybe uh what i mean you know, thanks for telling us about that and some incredible, you know, experiences and some incredible locations. J- just to add on to that, were you in Africa around the outbreak of the Ebola crisis earlier in the year? Yeah, that was slightly, that was slightly more than uh, six months ago, though. That was in October last year, and I spent a week in Liberia, yeah. And um, that was pretty, pretty, like, that was a pretty, um, and it, pretty, like, intense, remarkable, scary, and... Uh, difficult assignment because at the time I'm sure you'll all remember it was kind of mass hysteria around what Ebola was what it could do to you how you could catch it there was a lot of like uh, misunderstanding and there was a lot of fear and the virus itself was incredibly dangerous and I got the call from the news desk saying Abdi um, you don't have to say yes to this um, but we're looking for people to go to Liberia and, and would you potentially be up for going and at the time I was like um, um, do I want to go do I, want, do I not want to go but I've got this kind of guiding principle, if you like, that says if I'm if I'm asked to go somewhere, then in principle I'll, I'll never say no off the bat. There's nowhere I'll, I just won't go. Uh, I'll, I always say that in principle, yes. Uh, so like, let's start talking about what what the mechanics of it are. Like, what is involved? Who am I going with? Why are we going? Is it safe? Is it not safe? What precautions are we taking and stuff like that? And that got the kind of conversa- conversation rolling a day or two afterwards. I started getting calls from like uh, chemical weapons experts and like from our security team and from the reporter and the, from the producer. And actually, we uh, we worked for quite a large company, but there weren't that many people who wanted to go. Um, I think I was the only cameraman who was willing to go. There was only one producer who was willing to go uh, and able to go. And the correspondents also no part except the one that went. So it wasn't kind of um, a, an assignment that people were keen keen on doing, but it was a story that I needed telling. Uh, and it was pretty remarkable to, to, to be there. And afterwards, we we were in quarantine for three weeks in South Africa, not in what like kind of not not locked in one room, but we had to measure our temperature twice a day. We kind of monitored ourselves for any like rising temperatures and uh, colds and any signs of illness and stuff like that. And at the first sign of it, we'd have to call the news desk in London, who would call the uh, emergency medical reaction service in South Africa who would kind of come to see us and make sure that what we had wasn't Ebola. Wow. Um, well, very brave person, um, Abdi. Um, you know, oh, some... yeah, and also, Alistair, we, we were nominated for an Emmy for, that work, for the work we did there. Okay, now, and, you're, just, now um, you're just showing off, yeah. Abdi. You've always been a show-off. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, look, come on. You know, you don't, you don't deserve anything for that. You just get your paycheck. Get on to the next assignment. I mean, look, Emmys. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about that nomination for for, for, for an Emmy. That's amazing. Uh, but the we, 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 the nominations came in a couple of months ago, and um, the the guys, the producers and the executive producers in New York are the ones who put the submissions in, and they they put a whole bunch of stuff in. CBS is quite a large company. We do a lot of things, and we've got forty eight nominations across the board, across the board of like sixty minutes evening news. CBS This Morning, Sunday Morning, Face the Nation, all the different program strands that we have. And for the, the best coverage of an ongoing story, which is the category that we've been nominated for, uh, the work that I did, it is one of them. So um, I got to New York next week, Monday, the 28th, to find out if we've won. But it's pretty special to be nominated, even if we don't win, so that's good. That's amazing. Congratulations as well. And, and, and you know, well done for, for, first of all, like, well, getting through all of, of those environments, but also for going. I know, you know, a lot of people would struggle. A bit of context for the young people listening to this. Abdi and I know each other originally from university about 12, 13 years ago. We both went to a place called Ravensbourne. I was on the more fluffy directing, creative writing course. Abdi was on the more hardcore camera operator, you know, get ready to uh, get into the world and actually do something which matters, as opposed to me, you know, go and drink coffee and read a book and, and pretend I'm an artist. Um, but we, we met there at Ravensbourne and um, 
we then both went on, one of our first jobs was to work for the, for the military as independent contractors where we were camera operators and editors and we would travel around on warships on uh, pretend war game exercises. And that was a great training ground for me and, and obviously it's been um, brilliant for yourself, Abdi. Um, yeah. Abdi then very kindly referred me into ITN um, a couple of years later where I got a job as an editor. And then also he made other recommendations uh, where I got interviews for, for the BBC to edit programmes as well. So I just wanted to point out that that um, that employability skill about the, the importance of network. Um, Abdi's been very, very important to, to my career, and I'm sure there's been lots of other people in Abdi's career which is, uh, who have helped him over the years get jobbed. Uh, maybe we could talk about that a, li a little bit more. Um, that, that's, that's an incredible story of, of, of where you're at. Um, Abdi, just to reiterate, and for people listening to this, what, why this whole project with Sunflower Academy came about was because as Sunflower, my company tried to employ um, people who, who want to work in this industry. Um, over the last five years, we, we've, we've seen endless people who, who haven't had what, what we would deem to be the, the basic employability skills. They might have had a good showreel, they might have been good at you know, making, making short films, but we've really struggled with attention to detail, you know, um, writing a CV that hasn't got 10, 15 spelling mistakes, checking their punctuation, turning up on time. And I've seen endless people who were really good, were probably better than me when I was that age, but because, because no one has stopped them during university and said, look, your employability skills are so key, they've missed opportunities with us and they've missed being able to use us as a, as a stepping stone to big opportunities. And what I want to get across to people is if we just take that, that one, um, what, one of those employability skills, which is in, in, in the guide I've written, small steps, big leaps, attention to detail. Now, Abdi, you know, let's just, let's just think about attention to detail right now. And let's think about your experiences in Africa. You know, how key was having attention to detail from the moment that phone call went for you? Um, you yeah. know, will you go to uh, Liberia where there is an Ebola outbreak? You know, it must have been pretty, pretty hot. Could you, could you just give us your thoughts on that and, and tell us what you, th what you think about, you know, attention to detail and how important that's been to your career? Um, yeah, sure. Mate. Um, yeah, I, I agree totally that attention to detail, whether it's writing a CV, whether it's kind of keeping uh, and holding yourself to like the promises and the deadlines you make and things like that, uh, whether it's checking and making sure that you're ready and prepared for a job and so you've got all your kit uh, in order, batteries charged, uh, cameras working, that you've got kind of all the protective gear and things like that that you've got, that you need booked, turning up uh, on time to flights. Um, just kind of making sure that you communicate and that you're in touch with the people that are on your team and that you're kind of not um, adding to anyone else's kind of work hard, but you're kind of, um, you're, you're kind of sharing it in that regard is, is really, really important. So yeah, with the specific example of Liberia, attention to detail and as much as there was a lot of like prep that I needed doing for things that we needed to bring, clothing that we needed to wear. Uh, we, we were told not to bring anything kind of short sleeve and like closed um, shoes and things like that. There were many documents about the kind of the safety, the risk, the insurance that I had to pay really close attention to. And so reading all of that was really important and involved paying a lot of attention to the, 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 the detail of the work. And more generally, um, CV is important. It's in the little thing that people kind of get a really good impression of who and what and where you're coming from as they were. And um, one spelling mistake or something like that might not be the end of the world. But if you come across as being sloppy and not having given like uh, enough thought and consideration to an email that you send someone or to a CV that you send someone, or you say to someone, I'm gonna call you at this particular time, I'm gonna come and see you there, you don't. I think that could really reflect poorly on, uh, on, on yourself, on a young person trying to get a job. So um, yeah, I think it's just about being kind of, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Fastidious, if you like, in the way that you present yourself and, and, and in the way that you pursue something and, and kind of wanting to create and keep up a very good uh, impression of yourself in the mind of someone else. And, and you've got to appreciate that when you're, when you're talking. When I, was talk when, I was, when I was younger and I was calling um, production companies up to try and get some work experience or I was looking for a job I was talking to people often, or getting my first job at ITN, or the following one, getting my foot in at Al Jazeera English or something, 
I was always talking to people who were very busy, who had a lot of things on their mind, who, who might, with all their kind of best intentions, have wanted to help me, but who I needed to, I needed to make it easy for them to do that, if you like. I needed to show them that actually I was more kind of uh, considerate, more professional, more eager, more willing, more able than the next kind of five or six, 10, 15 people sending them exactly the same email asking if they've got any opportunities for work experience or some shadowing or some shifts. And, 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 and in order to do that, attention to detail was key because it was attention to detail in the emails that I wrote them, the tone in my CV and in the spelling and in the layout and how easily readable it was. It was in the kind of, in my persistence of calling them again and again and, and kind of trying to create a, a warm, personable relationship with them so that actually they didn't mind having me around and they were willing to kind of, um, they, they, they saw the best in me as it were. Yeah, no, some great advice. And, you know, in, in the case of the recent work you've been doing, you know, that, that attention to detail essentially could have been life-saving. And, and those habits, you know, need to start, you know, young really don't they if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna build a career in this industry um no, no yeah, point, yeah yeah totally it's, yeah, yeah i agree no point taking sort of you know short sleeve shirts if you've been told to take long sleeve but you haven't bothered to 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 check and 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 i think you know the, these can seem like quite pedantic little things for me to point out for for, for people listening but We've, we've seen huge numbers of people not take these things seriously and they've just spent £45,000 on a degree in media or they're about to. And, 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 and I worry for them, hence this content, because you don't make it in the real world if you don't have great employability skills, great attention to detail, turning up on time, etc., etc. And what we've... Yeah, I think, Alistair, there's, 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 there's something to be said about kind of that journey of growth from yeah. leaving school to getting a job to doing it for a couple of years. That, that it kind of involves um, that, 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 that fastidiousness, that professionalism, that awareness of kind of what is required of a job and all the rest of it, growing as it were. So I think when a kid leaves school and is kind of just getting in, that, like I was a bit green and kind of, I knew that I was, I had to be really, really careful and that I had to pay attention to the detail. But that, 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 that kind of awareness, that skill, uh, and it's definitely a skill, it's something that you develop, you hone and you get better at, the more you do it. Uh, and, and kind of the, the, the after you leave school, work experience, kind of working with your friends, all that stuff is, is actually it's such an important period to work on that skill and make yourself kind of more aware of what's involved uh, and kind of paying attention to the details and stuff. So that when you first get a job, you're not kind of um, you're not starting from scratch. You're not thinking, oh, my God, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. You're, you've already made it almost second nature, if you like, because you've been you've spent years working on it. Make it second nature. That's that's yeah. Make it second nature exactly. Yeah, that's that's key. So, um, I, I I I totally agree. I think what I want to what I want young people to 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 try and learn from the from the experiences we've had within my business is is we we feel like these things should be um, getting understood when people are in school, leaving school, and in college before they spend such huge amounts on the degree because. We've seen 26, 27 year olds who are, uh, you know, expecting to walk into the industry on forty thousand pounds a year, and they, yeah. they, they, they're late to their interview. Then they're late to their, you know, next meeting. Then they're late, um, and and when you unpick it, they say, "Well, I, you know, I was always, I was allowed to be late at uni for my lectures," and I, I think, and and, yeah. and, then, and then subsequently. They, they, they don't survive with us, they go on to somewhere else, they don't survive with them, and then they have to end up taking a job in another field just to make ends meet. So for anyone listening, um, absolutely, these skills are things you build up over time, but I think even if you're 12 years old and you're listening to this, or you're 16, like don't wait for someone else to tell you down the line like your employability skills are, are key. Start, start today. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, you want to be doing that when you're 12, 13, 14, when you're at school and you've just left school. Uh, you want to be making those mistakes then and getting better, not not kind of when you're at university and you've finished and you're looking for a job and potentially like you let your dream job go by because you're late or because you didn't read the instructions clearly enough about where something was or they said you've got to dress like this and you didn't you didn't look or there are spelling mistakes in your CV and stuff like that. Those are things that you want to get out of the way. You those like mistakes are a really important part of growth, but you do them before the crucial moment where actually it comes to kind of like a make or break 
And arguably, you're always in a make or break situation where you're always kind of looking for the next step up. You're looking for the kind of the next career development and, and things like that. But the older you get, uh, the more crucial those things become. And so if you're late for an interview and you're, you're, gra- you're a graduate from university, um, I'd be surprised if anyone gives you a job and, and you're late. Then you could have a really, really, really good reason. Uh, and even then, there'll be someone else who isn't late who'll probably get the job. And so, yeah, tardiness is, is, is not a really good, it's not a good quality at all. No, and you know, once again, small small things make make big differences. Totally.